everybody. Um, so I want to tell you a little bit of a story today. Um, so when I was uh, a PhD student at Stanford, I uh, was very excited about um, predicting things um, from images. So I, I, my specialty is in computer vision, so we were very excited about using publicly available images um, to predict certain things like demographic characteristics, voting patterns, et cetera, et cetera, right? So one of the things we were doing is we were saying, hey, um, we could predict crime rates, right? So um, on the left, you can see the actual uh, crime rates. Um, and on the right, you can see predicted ones. But I, as time went on, I started seeing some issues with this kind of work, right? So some of you might, might guess what I'm about to say. So here you can see um, estimated drug use in Oakland, right, on the left which is pretty, pretty spread out. And then on the right, you can see um, crime reports, drug uh, reports of drug use, right? They're not as spread out as um, on the left-hand side. So when you're doing this kind of prediction from data, what, which data are you using? You're not using the estimated drug use data. You're using the reported drug use, right, which is heavily, heavily biased, and in the US, um, you know, you'll see that the places where um, are, that are reported to have this kind of drug use are in overwhelmingly poorer areas and um, basically like places where most, you know, black and brown people live. And so statisticians like Christian Lom have talked about what's called um, a runway feedback loops. So, right, like law enforcement does this kind of analysis trying to predict crime hotspots, right? So they have ground truth, and what's their ground truth data that they're training from? It's who was arrested for a crime, which crime report, uh, was reported. It's not the same as who committed a crime. And then they use that data to figure out how many, what you know, neighborhoods have a lot of crime, and then they send more police to those neighborhoods. And clearly, if you have more police in certain neighborhoods, you're going to arrest more people. Right? And then that kind of seems to corroborate your ground truth, and you have this you know, feedback loop that just kind of uh, amplifies societal biases. Right? So there, but nevertheless, these kinds of predictive algorithms are being used everywhere. Um, so last year, I signed um, a letter against something called the Extreme Betting Initiative. And the Extreme Betting Initiative is something that was proposed by ICE, so Immigration Customs Enforcement. Um, and what they were proposing was to partner with uh, tech companies to analyze people's social network activity and determine whether someone would be a good immigrant, whether they should be allowed to immigrate or not, whether they're more likely to be a good citizen versus not. And as a refugee, um, this really worried me, because there's two questions to ask here. One is whether or not we should be doing this kind of stuff in the first place. And the second one is whether the tools, the automated tools we use to do this kind of analysis are robust enough, right? And so for me, the second one is, the answer to the second question is no, right? So here is one example where Facebook Translate translated um, a Palestinian's good morning uh, in Arabic to attack them, and this person was um, arrested. He was let, later let go once people saw what he actually wrote. But right, our translation tools are not there to be used in this kind of high-stakes scenarios. Um, given that I'm in uh, computer vision, I want to talk about face recognition or automated um, facial analysis tools are also being used in law enforcement, right, for high-stakes scenarios. Um, so then there's two questions. Again, is the first one is whether we should be you know, using these kinds of um, tools to identify criminals or not, and to, you know, for whatever. Actually, we don't even know what these tools are actually being used for. There is a, a report called the Perpetual Lineup Report that sh shows that one in two American adults are actually um, in some sort of face recognition database, and police can use it, um, law enforcement officials can use it however they want, whenever they want, and we don't even know what kinds of accuracies they have, and there's no standards for transparency. Right? And so there's two questions. First is, should these types of databases, should they exist? And second is, are these tools robust enough to be used in this kind of high-stakes scenario? And so my research says no in the second question, which is, so we, uh, my colleague Joy Bolomini and I, showed that um, some automated facial analysis tools, so in this case we talked about gender re um, recognition, so these tools look at 
a photo and they try to ascribe your, um, your gender. So they want to say, you know, you're either a male or a female. And so there's many issues even with that particular task of gender recognition. Um, first of all, they don't um, uh, even acknowledge non-binary identities and, you know, I don't even condone uh, gender recognition as a task in itself. But anyways, to show whether they're, to see whether there's systematic error rates or not, we look at uh, these tools they, they look at your photo and they say you're either a male or a female. And as someone's um, skin type gets, is darker and darker um, for women, you can see that the, um, the classification uh, approaches random chance, right? So if you flip a coin, it's like 50% accuracy. Um, so why is this the case? Um, so we have a hunch. Uh, when we were trying to do this kind of analysis, we were looking at data sets that existing, that existing data sets for face recognition systems, right? And we found them to be overwhelmingly lighter skinned and overwhelmingly male. So we first had to come up with our own uh, data set that was more balanced and by skin type and by gender in order to do our analysis, right? And so we use, what, why, what am I saying? Why am I saying skin type? Where, um, so we use this Fitzpatrick skin type classification system where you can see it goes from lighter to darker, right? So people have done this kind of analysis by race, but what does it mean? What does race mean, right? It's a, a, an unstable social construct across time and space. So someone, I can be black, you know, that person can be black. So we used something that was more objective. And so when you look at the overall accuracy of these gender classification systems, they look really high. But then when you break down the accuracy by gender, you can start to see gaps, so like 78% there for face plus plus. When you um, break them down by uh, skin type, you can see that it gets the accuracy gets lower for darker versus lighter skinned people. And then when you look at the intersectional accuracy by gender, you break it down by gender and skin type, that's when you see the highest um, disparity in error rates, right? So look at um, Microsoft, you have 79%, 65% accuracy. 65% um, for um, IBM. So once this, this work came out, this paper came out, um, there was a whole bunch of press about it. There were people calling for um, reg uh, regulation for face recognition or automated facial analysis tools. And IBM and Microsoft both came out with new APIs um, kind of seeming to fix this issue, right? But what does fixing this issue mean? So one thing I want to say, what are the lessons here? The first one is that we can't ignore social and structural problems, right? So we showed that there is some bias in face recognition tools. You just fix that, and now you make it accurate, and then you kind of release it. That doesn't fix the problem, right? You have to understand how is face recognition being used? Who is it being, um, you, who is it benefiting, and who is it not benefiting? So who are the people who are unfairly targeted by face recognition tools, let's say? And who are the people selling you know, face recognition tools um, to law enforcement? Um, who are the people involved in the creation of AI, right? Versus who are the people benefiting, who are the people not benefiting? So here is a conference. I took this picture. Uh, I, no, I didn't take this picture, but I use this picture all the time. I hope they don't, if they find out, they might not be happy. But this picture is at a conference called iClear. It is a machine learning conference, right? One of the leading machine learning conferences. And I don't see anybody who looks like the people who are unfairly targeted by um, certain uh, automated facial analysis tools or AI tools um, in this picture, right? So we cannot ignore social and structural problems. Um, this is really important because one example I want to give you is that this person, Deborah Raji, came up with a, a follow-up paper that showed that Amazon's recognition has similar biases to the ones I just talked to you about, gender biases. And this really scared Amazon, right? Like they were wrote blog post after blog post, um, kind of trying to discredit the study. And then there was a, a letter that we had signed by a whole bunch of computer vision researchers calling on them to stop selling this um, software to law enforcement. Right? But Deb, the first author of this paper that showed bias in their um, products, she almost dropped out of uh, her studies. She didn't want to be in tech anymore. 
um, she felt too isolated, she felt too discriminated against, and she, didn't wa she wanted to leave until she came to Black Nyat, which is a, an organization I co-founded with my colleague Radita Abeba and many other people. Um, and why do I spend so much time on Black Nyat? Because people like Deb would have dropped out of this field if it weren't for Black Nyat. Right, so even as a researcher, what I want to say is we cannot ignore social and structural problems. The second thing I want to say is that there are currently no laws or standards that govern how to use certain kinds of products, machine learning products or AI products, to, in, for what purpose, right? So there are no, there's, there's no restrictions. Um, so we don't know if like these algorithms that are being used by law enforcement are breaking certain laws. We don't know if algorithms that are being used um, for hiring are breaking equal employment opportunity laws. And so I advocate for standards and documentation. Um, and so other industries have been there. Uh, you know, my prior background was, was in electronics. And in electronics, every single component, something as simple as a resistor to as complicated as a, as a CPU comes with something called a data sheet, right? So a data sheet tells you non-ideal, uh, I'm sure a lot of people know about data sheets. A, a data sheet tells you non-idealities of a particular component, right? And so I think we should have data sheets for data sets and pre-trained models, right? So if you have uh, gender classification systems, um, what can I use this for? What should I not use this for? Right? Maybe I shouldn't use it for high stakes scenarios. What kind of data set was it trained on? Did you train it on people from 20 to 25, ages from 20 to 25 in a certain location? Or did you train it on a, a, a wider distribution? So um, I've been spending a lot of time this last year thinking about what kinds of um, standardizations we should have. Um, and so if you are interested in, in this uh, concept, uh, you can read these two papers, uh, data sheets um, for data sets and uh, model cards for model reporting. So one talks about what this looks like for data sets, and one talks about what this looks like for models. Uh, and um, you know, again, like we're not the first ones to be here. So it's, it's really interesting to look at parallels in other industries sometimes. So if you look at cars, right? When cars first came on the road, there were no stop signs. There were no like driver's licenses, there were no seat belts, right? And it took them a very long time to even start to legislate seat belts. I believe they didn't legislate it until 1967. And even after they legislated it, they had to have campaigns for people to wear um, seat belts, right? And then if you look at clinical trials, similar thing, right? There were a lot of unethical things that were done, um, uh, experimenting on vulnerable populations. Um, and also, uh, in clinical trials, they were not they did, they were not mandated to have like it, they didn't have to have women, for example, in clinical trials, right? And so you find that seven out of ten, I, I believe, eight out of ten drugs that were pulled out of the market unfairly, uh, um, not unfairly targeted women, because <laughs> th that's kind of always what I think about unfair. Uh, targeting of uh, uh, populations. But eight out of the 10 drugs that were pulled out of the market um, had negative consequences for women, right? Because things were not being tested on women. So it took many years to have standards in many other industries, and we should learn from these other um, industries. Um, so one thing I want to say is that when we talk about societal biases, there's many places where these biases enter. When we formulate what problems are important, when we collect training data, when we architect our models, when we analyze how our models are used, right? But for some reason, well, I know for why, um, in the research community at least, there's a huge focus on that one part, which is architecting how our models um, and loss functions are used, even though there's all of these things to think about. Um, and we know from surveys that people have done that a lot of people in industry um, are looking for guidelines on the data side, right? What to, what to do on the data side. I, I'm not sure if you guys agree with this. Because there's a lot of ethical concerns around data. Um, but it's not as glamorous, I guess, as working on kind of uh, model architectures. So I think a lot of us, at least in my field, should be um, more focused on the data side. Um, and so one, one thing I want to conclude by is saying um, that we want to end this concept of parachute science. So a lot of times when people in my field talk about fairness, ethics, et cetera, 
sometimes we use the pain of certain marginalized communities um, in our research, and we get famous, we give talks like me, uh, we can, you know, we have academic careers, we're getting paid, and we're not really alleviating the concerns of that marginalized group. We're not making space for people in that marginalized group and lifting their voices, right? And, I, and, I, and this has happened in many other fields, and I really hope that our field kind of uh, in AI moves away from that and towards kind of collaborating with people in marginalized communities and giving them a voice and lifting their voice. Thank you.